Let you introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Liliana Bombs, Associate Professor in Biology. I um, actually work, I work in molecular ecology and evolution of corals, but uh, have sort of drifted from the host, uh, solely working on the host, towards also including members of the microbiome. And so uh, what I'll be presenting today is the first half is the data we've had for a while. The second half is absolutely brand new, so the first people to actually hear this and it probably won't be quite as smooth as uh, the first half just because I haven't talked about it so much. So what I thought I'd do today is introduce the concept of the extended phenotype. And I will be using that concept for the deep and the shallow water corals. First off, let me acknowledge my collaborators, my uh, lab, as well as the funding sources and the folks that have contributed most of the data to the talk today are um, Todd La Jeunesse, Chuck Fisher, as well as a, a number of um, undergraduate students and Megan, who's here today. She works in the lab as the lab manager, as well as Sam Bolson, who's a grad student, joined with Chuck Fisher, and uh, he's not right here yet at this point. So um, for, for the coral folks in the room, uh, this is a well-trodden territory. You know, the corals are the trees of the ocean. They build the three-dimensional structure of the ecosystem. But what most of us tend to forget is that a large portion of coral diversity is actually in deep waters and in not in tropical waters, in temperate waters. So we find corals worldwide. It's just that only in the tropics, in the shallow water tropics, they build um, large uh, reef ecosystems. They provide economic services of over a billion dollar per year and we've just come out of the third global coral leaching event that lasted until June um, of last year. And during this bleaching event, over 70% of the corals worldwide experienced heat stress that caused uh, coral bleaching and mortality. In addition, in the Caribbean, we also had two category five hurricanes. And so those areas that did not experience the hottest temperatures instead experienced um, two category five hurricanes. So corals, coral populations worldwide have uh, taken a hit and this has been uh, part of an ongoing discussion when we're thinking about the future of coral reefs is whether these reefs are on a road to slime. This is um, a title from or a concept that Ho Goldberg in 2007 proposed that you know, corals in their projections given the current rate of coral warming, uh, of global warming and um, ocean acidification will proceed from a healthy three-dimensional coral reef ecosystem to a uh, more or less one-dimensional non-complex system dominated by algae and cyanobacteria. And an explicit <clears throat> assumption of these projections was that corals cannot adapt to climate change. Now we now know that uh, adaptation can be quite rapid and um, there's also other ways of uh, dealing with, with environmental changes, such as acclimatization. And as part of this, I've become more and more interested in understanding how the host and its microbiome work together to confront environmental changes. So when we look at uh, coral micro associations, we here have a schematic of a coral polyp. In the center is the mouth, it's surrounded by tentacles. And um, the central opening in the mouth leads to a gastrovascular cavity. And at the bottom, those squiggly lines are the coral skeleton. And here we can uh, distinguish three compartments in the adult animal. There's some mucus, it covers the tissue. It's a very dynamic habitat that has changing bacterial associates that depend in part of the overlying um, water column. Uh, some of those bacteria are also resident and uh, commonly associated with the corals. There's the epidermis, it's uh, apparently almost sterile. And then the gastrodermis is what we find in the shallow water corals, the uh, photosynthetic algal symbionts um, called symbiodinium. Now, overall in this, in this um, animal, there are some microhabitats that are actually also anaerobic. And together, uh, bacteria from different, a uh, wide range of bacteria um, perform nutrient cycling functions. But it's not just the symbiodinium and the bacteria that we find in the corals. There's also fungi as well as, well as endolithic algae that live in the coral skeleton. And there's archaea and viruses 
that all form this um, holobiont. And the roles are really diverse. Um, for most of these members, we don't actually know what their roles are. So they can range from antimicrobial activity to um, nutrient cycling uh, to uh, gene transfer roles that the viruses might play. And in return, the host provides shelter um, and protection. Now, these uh, coral symbionts range from mutualists to uh, commensals or parasites and a number of these groups are, uh, are known to cause infectious diseases like the bacteria. Some infectious disease outbreaks have caused large scale population declines of coral corals. Um, there are cyanobacteria that are associated with, it, uh, with, with, with coral diseases. And some of the members might be um, mutualist under some conditions, but in environment changes, they may uh, end up being more like parasites. And so um, I think this is important to keep in mind that, you know, um, coral symbionts really have a wide range of roles to play in this, in this system. So what is an extended phenotype? So in the first half, I'm gonna concentrate in fact on the symbiodinium. And this idea of an extended phenotype was uh, put forward, forward by Dawkins in 82. And it sort of um, says that the uh, indirect effects of genes on the environment are independent of the individual bodies in which they reside. So if you have a coral host with a symbiodinium, whether or not the gene that causes a particular trait of the holobiont resides in the coral or in the symbiodinium is immaterial when you're thinking about the effects of that holobiont on its environment. And in 2014, uh, John, previous student in the lab and postdoc, and I wrote a review where we applied this idea of an extended phenotype to coral holobionts uh, and um, suggested that a coral biont has unique extended phenotypes that may shape reef community dynamics. Now, here for this first half, I'm gonna talk about the dinoflagellate symbodinium, but do we have any kind of a point or anything? So, um, uh, dinoflagellates are part of the alveolata, and the most um, well-known members of this group are the ciliates, the dinoflagellates, and the apicomplexin. The apicomplexins are mostly parasitic, um, including the malaria-causing ca human parasites. And um, within the dinoflagellates, we have a huge um, diversity of species, and uh, some of them are photosynthetic and part of the phytoplankton, some of them are sym symbiotic and photosynthetic, and uh, symbiodinium itself is now being described as a new family by Tala Jeunesse and colleagues. And within this new family, there are several different clades that are probably about genus level designations. And I'm gonna be concentrating on just one species in this clade A group. It's uh, called symbiodinium fitti. It's a um, associate of Caribbean reef building corals and um, some, uh, Necropa palmata, the alcum coral of which you see a photo there, exclusively, almost exclusively associates with this particular species. Now, what I'm going to stress here is that in this particular case, we are able to come up with a matrix like this where we have a particular host genotype, so a distinct genotype of the host species, say colony C, or um, that then is associate, associated with a particular strain of this Simodinium fetai species, so that you can get um, associations between host and symbiont genotypes that result in, for example, holobiont CA, where you have genotype of the host C associated with strain A, but sometimes perhaps this this particular host genotype may be associated with strain B, and this is possible because these um, corals fragment and um, build large clonal stands. And Symbiodinia fitta in itself uh, can reproduce mitotically or through asexual reproduction as well. So what this um, concept of the extended phenotype re requires for us to really work with it are uh, a few sort of prerequisites. And I'm gonna go through those and show you evidence for each one of them. 
So for one, it has to, if this extended phenotypes make any difference at all, then you know, this requires not all colonies are equal in that they differ in host and symbiont genotype for some time, that the interaction between the host and the symbiont genotype matters, and in turn that selection can act on that variation. And here, um, let me introduce you a little bit to the life cycle of the coral, I think it'll make it easier to understand. Start with a mature coral colony here. Uh, these guys are hermaphroditic, so they release eggs and sperm bundles once a year to the water column, so they're hermaphroditic, but they do not self-fertilize. So the egg sperm bundles float to the surface of the ocean, there the bundles break apart, and the eggs get fertilized by sperm from a different coral genotype. Then the larvae develop in the water column, for a little bit, and once they're mature enough, they will seek out the bottom um, metamorphose into a primary polyp, and at that point, they take up new symbiodinium from the water column, and through budding, an asexual process, build a mature colony. The mature colonies themselves, however, can fragment through um, physical disturbances such as storms, and the, the fragments, when they, the branches they fall off, can reattach to the ground and grow into new colonies again. So this is a way of which, in which you can get these large clonal fields of host genotypes. So um, first off, what we wanted to understand was whether you know, we can really say these different coral genotypes have different phenotypes. So we concentrated uh, in this particular experiment on coral larvae because for the coral larvae, we knew that they were symbiont free, and so we could describe any performance differences to the genotype of the host rather than the symbiont, which is much more difficult to do in the adult colonies. In this case, we generated larval pools. So we collected um, gametes from four parental, four, four, distant, four, four distinct parental genets. We pooled the gametes to generate batch crosses, and we did this several times. And then we reared the different batches in um, cool and normal and in hot water and sampled them um, over time to look at development as well as gene expression patterns. And um, here is just a brief summary of this uh, differential gene expression experiment. And without going into further detail, of course, there were many genes that were differentially expressed with time because they're going through uh, development but there were um, distinct batch effects, so different batches expressed their genes differently, and they interacted with temperature differently. So this was important for us because we knew now that, you know, there were some parents who were going to produce larvae that were better able to deal with hot temperatures during their development, which is uh, important for um, conservation purposes. But the other aspect of this was that we could find distinct differences in the way that the batches reacted to this. So all of, so this is batch two, batch five, at 48 hours and 29 degrees Celsius. You can see differences here that actually become more pronounced over time. So this is um, 48, 24, 48, 24 type of different uh, temperatures. So we, that was so that the first one is okay. You know, you kind of expected there to be, I mean, there ought to be differences within the species in terms of um, phenotypes, right? There's got to be variation within the species to some extent. So that wasn't a big surprise, but it hadn't really been shown well before. So now um, we want to not only look at the genotypic diversity of the host, but we also wanted to understand um, how the, the symbiote genotypes interact with that host genetic variation. And the first step was to develop genetic markers that would actually allow us to figure out what the genetic diversity of the symbiodinium strains was in each of the coral colonies. This was a um, large survey. Um, so what we did is we developed microsatellite markers that were specific to this particular species of symbiont and it had good power to distinguish clonal strains from each other. And we applied those markers to coral colonies that we had collected from across the range of species, ranging from the Bahamas you know, to uh, Panama, Bonaire, Curacao, Puerto Rico, and so on and so forth. So there were several thousand colonies that were screened. And what we found is that for 
um, the large majority of the colonies we only had one coral, only one symbiont strain in that colony. And this was true whether we sampled the colony once or several times, so several different um, branches of the same colony, and um, whether we sampled it uh, over time. So the same colony was sampled uh, over the course of one year or two years. Uh, we had actually a few samples that were that taken 10 years apart. And for the most part, those associations were really stable. There were single host symbiont strain associations that were stable over time. Now, there were some exceptions to this. We found, some, found sometimes that there were two different strains infecting a coral colony. And in those cases, we could actually infer some sexual recombination. So um, in contrast to previous findings that had suggested sexual reproduction in these symbiotic might occur in the water column, this looked like there's at least sometimes recombination that also occurs in the coral coast. And in some cases, you know, you get some, a little bit of a mosaic where a couple of branches have two strains, and then in, in, in other places, one of the other strain dominates. But in the vast majority of cases, one host colony hosts one simondinium strain. So if you look at this in a spatial matter, and this, these are polar plots that we did. So you go to a reef, you find a focal point, you tie a transectal to it, use a compass to give you the distance and the heading from this um, focal point, and then you have random numbers to collect, select colonies and uh, randomly put a sample of those colonies, genotype the host of the symbiont, and this is how you get these plots. And if you have, in this case, what we did is the same shape gives you the host genotype and the same color would indicate so under A there in Horseshoe Reef, we had uh, 25 colonies we collected. They were all the same host genotype, and they all had the same symbiont genotype. And this suggests, if you substitute time for space, that um, this association has been stable for a really long time. In fact, when we use microsatellite markers to look at the accumulation of somatic mutations within this host clone, um, it could be that this host clone is several hundred years, if not thousands of years old. And unless the entire host clone stand uh, switch symbiont strains, you know, simultaneously at some point in the past, this appears that the association with this host clone and that symbiont strain has been very constant, very stable for a really long time. Now, in other cases, this, you know, the picture is a little different. This in B, you see a, a polar plot from Oxnest Bay in the Virgin Islands, and there there's many different shapes. So there's lots of different host clones, but all of them, except for one, house this green Simonidium Kudai strain. So in that case, you have the situation where it's only one Simonidium Kudai strain associated with a variety of host clones. And then in Curacao, we have one of an example here where in fact there was some switching. And so if you look at this clone here, this is the same host clone, but two of the members have a purple strain <coughs> and one of them has a more common red strain. So it's not that switching never occurs, but it's uh, not that common. Okay, to summarize this part then, um, we saw that palmata coral colonies typically harbor only one strain of Simonidium fiti. And this is not exclusive uh, for this, this particular coral uh, symbiont uh, interaction, but it's also been found for an octocoral associated with a symbiodinium in clade B. Overall, switching is rare and associations are long lived. And if we have cases of co infection, we can infer sexual recombination. But the, the question that this does not answer is whether or not the symbiont genotype perform differently in different host genotypic backgrounds. And so this is an important experiment that you need to do in, if, in, to show that there indeed is functional variation among host symbiont combinations um, uh, relating that to this concept of the extended phenotype. And this year was a central experiment of John Parkinson's PhD in, in the lab, um, actually co-advised by Todd as well. And uh, what we did here is we had a natural common garden in Puerto Morelos, Mexico, where we had several Acropora palmata host colonies that were of different genotype 
but they all share the same symbiont fetai strain. Okay, so in this case, what this allows us to do is sort of look at the performance of this one symbiont fetai strain in different host genetic backgrounds. And um, we, because these corals have grown very close to each other for a really long period of time, um, you know, there might be microenvironmental variation between those colonies, but um, certainly not uh, any macroenvironmental variation. It was, you know, very close. It grew very close to each other. So the experimental design was as followed. follows. We collected fragments of the uh, standing colonies, and then we split them up so that we had, uh, you know, clonal replication of each of the six host genotypes in three temperatures, 20, 27, and 30, 40 degrees Celsius. Um, and I'm going to talk most, mostly here about the 20 and 27 degree result. After three days of exposure to these, um, to these temperatures, we did a number of measurements, including hemp spirometry, as well as gene expression analyses. So here is the um, photobiological measurements uh, we took during the stress, and it depended on the host genetic background. So what is plotted is uh, time on the x-axis, and on the y, there's quantum yield of photosystem 2, and um, the, the vertical line indicates when the cold shock happens. So symbionts from host colonies B and Z had a very small difference in their quantum yield between the normal temperature and the cold shock whereas symbionts from hosts A, D, X, and Y showed a very large difference between um, the, um, the quantum yield between the, whole, the cold and the normal temperatures. And if you take this difference and express it as something called delta QM, you can see a, um, uh, an interaction effect here and um, plot it on by coral genotype we can distinguish these groups, but also notice that they're not binary groups. It's a continuum, you know, but this grouping was supported uh, using some statistical modeling. So in order to facilitate the discussion, we group these two together and then these four because of their similarity in response to the uh, treatment. So <clears throat> what we then came up with were these two types of host genotypes in terms of their in terms of the photosynthetic efficiency of the symbiont strain, right? So remember, they all share the same symbiont strain. So one had uh, the one the first group had a small delta QM. They were less efficient in terms of their photo the, the yield of photosystem two um, under normal conditions, but they showed a very small difference between um, the hot and the cold and the normal and the cold treatment under stress. So they were more um, they didn't perform quite as well under normal conditions, but they, keep, they kept that performance pretty steady under uh, stressful conditions. Um, the second group had, was more efficient under normal conditions, but showed uh, large differences between the hot and the cold treatment. Now, interestingly, just by, so these groups were based on the photobiology of the symbiont performance, right? So, uh, when we then looked at what the host gene expression was like in those two groups, we found something I think that's pretty remarkable in that the um, dynamic hosts only here, um, we had, so we had basically the, the opposite uh, effect of the, of, the, of the stress experiment on the host gene expression. So for this group, um, the symbionts photobiology changed very, bit, very little between um, the stress treatment, but the gene expression of the host uh, showed a large response. So the host changed a lot. It appears like the host changed a lot to keep its symbiont performing at, um, at, at, a, at, a, at a sort of constant level. And these, um, those host genotypes that perform better under normal conditions in, in terms of photosynthesis but um, where their symbionts uh, delta QM changed a lot, uh, basically changed none of their gene expression in response to this to the stress. So um, what this told us was there's some evidence for functional variation among 
post simoyam combination. So obviously what this experiment doesn't test is how one host genotype deals with different symbiont strains, right? So that opposite experiment we haven't been able to do because we haven't been able to find those combinations um, yet in, in, in a place where we can actually do the experiments. So um, that's still an outstanding experiment to do. But in this case, where we test how the semi strain does in different host genetic backgrounds, we see there's functional variation amongst those combinations. And I'm not gonna go into detail on how we get at this particular conclusion, but what we inferred through the patterns of gene expression we saw is that the host affects symbionts perhaps via regulating the iron avail availability to the symbiont during the um, stress events. And in turn, the symbiont signals to the host that it is experiencing uh, stress through, through changes in the redox state. And those are two aspects that are, or predictions basically, that are currently being tested by other groups. For example, Hannah is looking at iron, the role of iron in, um, in the post symbiont uh, interactions. So what this experiment led us to um, postulate was that there perhaps are trade-offs between high photosynthetic performance during normal conditions uh, and the ability to respond to temperature stress. Now, you know, there's one thing to say that there is functional variation, but um, the other is that this should be responsive to selective pressures. So um, we want to see where there is a potential for co-adaptation between host and symbionts given, given the performance variation that we saw. And I approached this from where my background is, and this is population genetics. So I wanted to understand over what spatial scale a adaptive allele may spread if it was present in the population, right? So if the symbiont strain has a particularly um, you know, good allele for performing under hot temperatures, how fast could it spread to the population over what spatial scales? And in case there is a reciprocal um, mutation required for the host, then you would want those scales of gene flow um, to be comparable, right? Otherwise, uh, the adaptive allele in the symbiont spread or might spread over a smaller spatial scale or a larger space, spatial scale than the reciprocal mutation in the coral host. And so um, we approached this using um, population genetics. Again, we had range-wide samples and um, applied those microsatellite loci to uh, determine any kind of barriers to gene flow and saw that um, under a um, Bayesian model of population structure uh, analysis here, here are the locations on the x-axis and each individual bar here is a, a unique um, strain. Uh, and the y-axis gives you the proportion of membership in a particular cluster. And so what the program here inferred was that there were about seven clusters uh, in over this geographic range. And you can see that those clusters are approximately by geography. So Florida and the Northern Bahamas here actually form this sort of orange cluster. The Bahamas have their own it's purple. There's a bit of admixture here across Navassa and Puerto Rico. Virgin Islands and some the Grenadines form one, Bonaire, Curacao's a little bit it's mixed with this yellow guy in between. We don't really know what that is. And then Panama and finally Mexico is pretty distinct. And so uh, the symbiont has really small scale population structure. Now compare that to the population structure of the host, and we're in the, up, in the process of updating this with genome-wide SNPs, so this is only based on five microsatellite loci in this particular case. But um, and it, you know, while the additional genetic markers give us a bit more uh, population differentiation, overall, the uh, coral appears to have populations that are much larger than what we see for the symbiont. So if this um, continues to hold, then in the example I had before, a, a positive or a, a allele under selection in the host might spread over uh, the entire Eastern Caribbean, whereas a um, selectively advantageous allele for the symbiont may only spread within Panama over the course of what we can measure with these population genetic data. So within a reasonable uh, time frame, that is. <clears throat> 
And um, to conclude this part, and the host of the simion have different population structures, thus the mutations in the simion spread over small spatial scales, and this may limit uh, co-adaptation. Now, interestingly enough, there is a whole bunch of theoretical work that predicts the amount of gene flow and dispersal in host parasite systems, but there is much less theoretical uh, work on how um, the same should happen for uh, mutualists and their hosts. So there is not a whole lot of theoretical prediction that we can rely on to understand whether or not this is a common uh, pattern that we should expect or if this is something uh, that is unusual. So, um, one, so to, to in overall for this particular section, what we saw is that a, geno, a host, one semi genotype can express different photobiological efficiencies in response to thermal stress depending on the host genetic background. That patterns were, those patterns were mirrored in the host gene expression and thus subspecies level coral and symbiont genotypic interactions appear ecologically relevant and may present a target for selection during climate change. And those uh, findings altogether I think um, provide some evidence that this concept of the phenotype is, is one that might be useful when we think about how corals may adapt and acclimatize to a rapidly changing environment. Now for the second part, I'm actually going to talk about um, another group of alveolates, but these are um, uh, apicomplexin relatives. And we know very little about them other than that they are uh, commonly found in corals. So these guys are um, in the sister group to the dinoflagellates, somewhere between the recently um, discovered chromera, which is photosynthetic, the colpodelates, which not, not much is known about those either, and the apicomplexins, which were proposed to be exclusively parasitic. And um, this is all, so chromera was, I I believe discovered in 2012. Right, so it's recent. It's a recent discovery. It was it caused a lot of excitement because Chromera uh, actually clarified where the um, alveolates uh, got their photosynthetic plastics from, and um, it clarified that the origin of the photosynthetic ability of this group was actually a red alga. Now um, the um, this photos so the photosynthetic plastid of this chromera, where this in this tree, I don't have a pointer. No, it won't show up. I've been trying, and it doesn't. It doesn't show up on the screen for whatever reason. Um, so chromera is uh, on. You know where the thirty-five is right there in ARL three. That's the chromera. It's, and as I mentioned, it's uh, photosynthetic and it's uh, related to both the chloroplast of the photosynthetic dinoflagellates you know, and the relic chloroplast of the apicomplexa, which um, has been uh, converted into this um, structure called the apicoplast. And uh, this is based on um, the plast at small uh, SSU RNA. And they have a, um, as well as the, PSPA gene. So this confirmed that the apicomplexins and the dinoflagellates share a common ancestral chloroplast lineage, and it is thought that the uh, common ancestor contains uh, a chrome alveolate plastid that possessed both chlorophyll A and chlorophyll C, and the peridin dinoflagellates kept their plastid while the chrome alveolate plastid degenerated um, in other dinoflagellates as well as the apicomplexins. And um, some of the dinoflagellates then replaced this original plastid with a new one that uh, uh, enabled them to photosynthesize while other members of this group had to turn to heterotrophy because they lost the ability to photosynthesize. So photosyn photosynthesis is sort of a uh, ancestral feature of this group. The um, parasitic apicum Plexins retain a plastid, but then it's now called an apicoplast. It cannot uh, photosynthesize. Now, um, the question now is, and this is a recent uh, paper, well, it's 2012 in Current Biology, which surveyed 
uh, the uh, diversity of this clade of alveolates and uh, came up with this sort of nomenclature of having um, six apicomplexin related apicomplexin relatives. So this, this is ARL1 through six. And um, it is known that ARL1 and ARL3 are photosynthetic and they're uh, commonly asso associated with uh, corals. In fact, uh, here are all of those, the green and the blue, or the green and the red arrows indicate where they're all found across the world. Now, ARL5 is a group that uh, was also found in coral surfaces, and this particular um, group suggested that um, because ARL5 is, is what is commonly found in sclerotinians worldwide, it is also photosynthetic, but they had no direct evidence for this. This is an important question because of this um, whole idea of where photosynthetic ability and where the plastids in this group come from and how the AP complexins um, converted uh, their uh, plastid to an apicoplast. So um, here is, I think, where the deep sea corals can really inform our way forward because while corals are best known to thrive in the warm, shallow waters, almost 66% of the coral diversity is found in waters deeper than 50 meters. So a majority of coral diversity is not in tropical, uh, shallow waters. And indeed, for the uh, stelastrid corals, 89% of the diversity is uh, in the deep. Uh, black corals at 75%, aqua corals at 75%, and even for the sclerotinians, it's 40% uh, of the species. Now for the stelastrid corals, there's um, evidence that the shallow water uh, relatives actually are derived um, from the deep. So there was a um, sort of offshore to onshore um, diversification of these corals. And so it follows that uh, we might be able to look into the deep to understand something about the ancestral uh, state or the evolutionary history of these coral species. And thus, um, they it might also tell us about how these corals uh, evolved their symbioses. And uh, here this is <coughs> a photo of Telegorgia delta. It's a deep water coral that this has actually really wide distribution. We've worked with this a lot in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, you wouldn't remember Fanny's um, uh, dissertation. She mentioned this one as well. Um, Sam has been working with it extensively. And in fact, all of the data I'm showing you right now is uh, work that Sam has um, just, uh, it's just in the middle of completion, actually. So this is a um, phylogenetic tree using 16S tag sequencing data. And uh, this tree contains, uh, as you can see, many, many, many uh, um, um, coral 16S sequences that were derived from um, both deep, uh, shallow, and mesophytic corals. And those are indicated by the different colors. And so there are, these era of five relatives are clearly found very commonly both in shallow and deep water. And the deep water is so deep that photosynthesis is impossible. So this leads us to conclude, given that the evolutionary history of, of these corals might be in the deep, it is unlikely to be photosynthetic, at least, um, you know, at, at the very least in the deep water corals, but uh, likely also not in the shallow water corals. Now, um, they are also extremely, these, these, eight, these ARL5 relatives are extremely widespread. So the different colors here indicate the host um, species they were selected from. They range from a black coral, uh, from, a, from a couple of black corals. There is uh, uh, octocorals in here, this is proper from in the shallow water. And the, uh, the, the, the not colored um, uh, sequences up there are the ones being pulled from public databases. And they include Parides, Montastria, Favia, um, uh, Musimilia, uh, Gorgonia. So basically, you can expect to find these guys in your system as tax sequence data if you actually look. And um, what we have absolutely no idea about is what they do. Now, 
business work I've been doing um, at the Max Planck Institute in Bremen. Uh, last summer, in collaboration with Nicole Dubovier's lab, we did um, the microscopy of um, Calogorgia, and this is a um, section where you see the central, this is the central stalk of the colony, and then it has these four polyps uh, surrounding the stalk. And each of the polyps has uh, tentacles around the mouth in the center, so this is the orientation here. And if we focus in on uh, this particular spot right here, you see these really interesting features where the center is uh, shows this uh, large aggregation of um, blue stains, and so these are DAPI stains, um, nuclei, they almost look like bunches of grapes. And they're surrounded by um, these rod shapes, as well as some other larger uh, bacteria. This is a eukaryotic um, uh, fluorescent hybridization, uh, in-situ hybridization probe. So um, we're suspecting that this, air, that, that you know, some of these features uh, include um, or might be this AP complexin, and we're we're trying to develop a um, AP complexin specific probe to look for the distribution of that particular group within the within the host tissue. And can we start learning something about its function by figuring out where it's located? So, what we what I think the deep water corals have been able to tell us is that you know, they're often associated with corals, but they don't appear to be uh, photosynthetic. So um, we're sort of at a loss of, at what exactly their role is. I mean, you know, if, if they are really truly on the way to, or have already developed an apicoplast similar to what the true apicoplast parasites have developed, then is this a sign that they, that they are just really wide, widespread um, parasites of corals? like all the parasites that will do a lot of damage, which is why we might not come across them before, or the commensals, do they fulfill some mutualistic growth? We really don't know. But it's, um, I think, part of the coral holobiome we um, should uh, investigate further. OK, so for the last <clears throat> five minutes or so, I'm going to um, tell you about a really brand new finding that we've just have gotten in the last couple of weeks. So this is truly brand new and um, still needs a lot of work. But I think uh, it gets to this last part of, um, of the potential of this, this, this holobiont to uh, also house disease-causing organisms, at least under some environmental circumstances. So I'm now switching gears. I'm going to look at um, a particular bacterium that we think might cause uh, coral larval diseases. And uh, what it is, is is the dreaded pink stuff. So this is a scientific term <laughs> that's been in use for at least uh, for us for the last uh, 15 years or so. And every once in a while in our uh, high-tech larval cultures, uh, you can, you can, these, are, these are these uh, individual larval culture vessels, and this is uh, uh, lar individual larvae, they're about 300 microns across, so there's a whole bunch of them. And this is sort of their normal color, they're a little bit, you know, they're coral in color. And um, every once in a while, we get these, these pink infections, and uh, the lar individual larvae will turn hot pink, but um, they will also stain any kind of, it, like, it can get so bad that it stains the plastic. Uh, the plastic culture vessels, the silicone tubing, they get a pink sheen on it. And um, here, this is a water filter, so that those, you can know, use these canister filters here to filter the water. And um, these are globs of um, lipids, basically, when the, when the larvae are very much rich and they disintegrate and die, you know, they can form large lipids, sort of clumps. And this is the color, they turn hot pink like this. Um, if we add antibiotics to our larval cultures, it makes it worse. Um, antibiotics are more expensive infection. The only way that uh, I've been able to stop the spread of this is by bleach and bleaching absolutely everything and rinsing it. So this um, so it told us that we have some sort of infectious agent that causes um, 
these larval cultures to crash every so often. And these observations were made across several species in the Caribbean. So we have it in the Prepara, in Orbicella, in Florida, Australia made these larval cultures. So it's fairly widespread. Uh, it, it had, we observed it in Florida and Curacao, in Mexico, and in Puerto Rico. So it's also not you know, locally restricted. And it was, these observations were made by uh, three to four different groups um, that worked independently on these coral larval cultures. So um, the, this is a 16S tax survey of a normal culture and a culture that had turned turn pink that we sequenced from Puerto Rico in 2009. And this particular uh, pie chart is focusing on the gamma proteobacteria in those cultures. And here, this is the normal culture on the left. And on the right, on the infected culture, you see that uh, the diversity appears to increase. It becomes, um, and new groups sort of show up in this, in the 16S tag data that were previously uh, either not present or in very, very low concentrations. And the one in red there is an Alteromonas um, that uh, closely matches in estuary bacter species in, in uh, BLAST databases. So Chris and Marhaver in Curacao managed to actually do some uh, isolation of bacterial strains from infected larval cultures. And in 2014, uh, strain and iso so isolated and screened strains, uh, one of which caused heavy mortality in these three larval cultures when she, after isolation, infected the larval cultures with that particular strain. And um, when we did 16S sequencing of that particular isolates, it all came back, back at the same estuary bacter. So we found the estuary bacter in the infected cultures in 2009 in Puerto Rico and independently in Curacao, Kristen was able to isolate and reinfect larval cultures with this particular strain also um, caused mortality. Um, interestingly enough, those larval cultures also turned hot pink um, eventually. Now, what we haven't done, what she's still working on is to try to, after infecting the larval cultures and they turn hot pink, re-isolate that original buck. So that's something we're still working on. But we've just uh, completed a um, full genome sequencing of this particular strain um, of this isolate that caused the heavy mortality and the pink cultures and um, found indeed that it is something that somewhere in the Alteromona ACA uh, most closely matches an estuary bacter lawful strain. And um, this actually, when we look at the genome content, pretty typical of all the Alteromonas. So it um, is, uh, they're often antibiotic uh, resistant. So this is what is predicted from culture work and what we observed in the genome. So it has these antibiotic resistant genes. Um, there, there's a virulence and pathogenicity is predicted, but from the genome, uh, there are high optimal, it has high optimal growing temperatures, which is a particular concern because our um, surface waters are increasing in temperature. And it, they're generally aerobic, but could be facultatively anaerobic. So this is predicted and we still need to test that as the case. So this is a question we're interested in because we're wondering whether or not this particular infection is particularly common in our larval cultures because uh, perhaps our cultural conditions are suboptimal, and so we get these infections because uh, either it's an aerobic or you know it's too crowded for some other reason. Uh, so we, um, we are not sure yet whether or not this is a problem that commonly occurs in the wild, or whether this is something that we see under culture conditions. Now, um, what makes me what really gives me pause about this is that we have in the Caribbean observed. Uh, uh, a real lack of sexual exclusivity. So even though we have space um, in lots of places, management has gotten better. So uh, the algal masses that have previously been for reduced and reduced reduced are actually quite, quite low. And yet we don't see that many sexual exclusivity. So um, I'm wondering whether or not there's something that affects the water in the water column 
and we would never know because you know, it's extremely difficult to, to catch <clears throat> the coral larvae in the wild. So I think it is enough evidence to really start paying attention to this these things, whether or not these 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 larvae are experiencing infectious diseases in the wild that uh, escaped our notice so far. And I should also say that you know I am not I'm not entirely convinced yet that this is actually the causing uh, solely by itself, or whether this is a consortium where if you get it out of whack, you know, you can cause this disease if it has to do with the swimming and, and so on and so forth. So there's still a lot of work to do, but um, in some ways, this is probably as far as we've gotten for any larval coral disease in terms of fulfilling Cox postulates. So in conclusion then, um, here what we talked about today is a, sort of a, a, a wild ride through the coral symbionts ranging from mutualists to perhaps commensals, um, as well as some of the disease causing um, bacteria in this uh, coral holobion. And I think altogether we really need to uh, work on this to understand how corals may survive the impending environmental changes that are only forecast to get worse. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Yeah. So um, thank you so much. It was um, very, very interesting from some of the experience mm -hmm. and my further questions and participants. And I would just recommend that maybe you or someone from your lab would like to consider providing my this summer because I think there's a lot of similar similarities with, with uh, um, and I think there could be real interesting overlap and discussion so just throw that out there I don't know how some of the other phytobiologists do it but I think they're very similar um, things I And the other thing to keep in mind is we have some of the, the leaders from phytobiomes around the world coming to Washington State. And they could be here talking about microbial communities, but of course, you know, the investments of the wild and the tame world. The very similar kinds of questions. Just throw that out there. Lots of microbiome. Um, I, that was a great talk. Um, for the, the last piece there, how, can you find algae monads? I'm sure you don't know if they're elsewhere or not. Are there any healthy larvae? Or could it be some kind of opportunistic interaction where like, maybe it's room temperature or something where the anaerobic factors are increasing the growth of those? So I, we're, we still have to do a systematic surveys of all of the medieval data and just mess that data. Around, but uh, they're not as, as for, for sure they, they don't pop up as, as a dominant group as they do in the infected cultures. Now, what makes me think that they are fairly common either in the coral mother colonies themselves or close by in the sediment is that we find them across the Caribbean. So, this is so this is so you know there's a couple of ways forward. We could, we could screen the sediment and water sample database that are available, you know. We could Look at you know whatever we have in the results as well to see if this pops up. But it's a really kind of a weird guide because these astrodactors are, are extracted from, from sediments. And, um, and they're, as far as I know, like they've not been flagged as either pathogenic in any way or being associated with, with corals. But Altramonas, um, there are some disease causing Altramonas and they are associated with. Um, Number of invertebrates. So it's not impossible that they might actually be part of the multi biome. So um, I was wondering how to tie or how much of the relationship between symbiotic and corals are. So the symbiotic and the other aspect of the slide, where it's not associated with that potentially spawning a larger population structure. Yeah, so in this case, uh, you can find um, uh, several different modes of transmission in these particular uh, coral, in, in corals overall. But this particular species is horizontal, so 
there's a part of the submarine life cycle that's in the water column. And um, so the uh, new settlers take up the submarine from the water column. So while the submarine is in the water column, there's certainly an opportunity for it to spread or you know, travel between reefs during time and the lake. So that would be the part of the life cycle where uh, you know, dispersal can happen. Uh, <laughs> almost there. Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, in the, in the film, how stable is the situation in these labs? And given whole populations are, like, what is the narrative of these stays? Or is there is no narrative? But I know you kind of looked at more population perspective. Is there kind of just known <clears throat> that that is that an actual record? So every day the coral colony will uh, will expel uh, some portion of its mycelium. In fact, since like yeah. so I, in fact there is some there's some periodicity to this, almost like what you see in the squid vibrio system, um, where uh, and I just there's just a little paper out there, single cell and it belongs to so interesting in terms of the like during the course of the day and the night, um, the coral will expel some portion of the new cell cells, some of which are are uh, you know not viable any longer, but a good portion of it is viable. And so, you know, if you look at a coral colony, it sort of has a what I imagine to be a cloud of somebody new cells, you know, swirling around it at any point in time. So um, there is some so, so, you know, taking up new cymbidinium is going to be certainly influenced for, for a baby coral that settles on a reef, right? It'll be influenced by whatever adult corals are around it, because those will be the most likely source for it. Uh, I mean, for an adult, like that. For um, an adult um, you know, they're filter feeders. So they would be taking up and filtering out cymbidinium cells out of the water column all day long. And yet, when we look, a particular symbiotic strain established in the adult host almost never switches. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so for some reason they're able to, I don't know who does it, it's unclear whether the host keeps the symbiotic, you know, stable or is the symbiotic not letting anyone else in. I mean, none of that is really all that well understood. But uh, whatever the case, it's stable. In this species, in that, in this host, and that's somebody. Now, in other coral hosts, that's not the case. They're much more flexible. They might change species of somebody and genera of somebody. So it really the, the 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 host species differ a lot in how flexible they are with regard to what somebody does. Is it known to be stable in crowded environments? Like you're talking about, like maybe a mass switch, like with an increased temperature, could it sort of change which ones it's not going to be taken in? Yeah, so this was a, 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 a hypothesis that was put forth and extensively tested, and it turns out that 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 while you might get a temporary replacement of the dominant symbiotic species with hot temperatures, uh, in a lot of the cases it reverts back to the original one. When you stress it. So, um, there, it, it, you know, whatever there, what this tells me is that, and I think we're very agrees, is that there are some serious trade offs um, in terms of high temperature performance and performance on normal temperatures that don't allow a coral species to permanently associate with the temperature tolerance in my opinion, um, probably because they don't transfer it quite as much. What I think was new about this is our first indications that this isn't just a species trait for Simonidinia, but that there are different strains of the same Simonidinia species that may also show differences in performance um, under stress. So there are subspecies level variations. Hey. <laughs> <laughs>